Our text today is from chapter 22 of the book of Kings. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. The two kings here, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, planned a joint military expedition against the Syrians at Ramoth Gilead. On the surface, the campaign made sense. Ramoth Gilead had once belonged to Israel, but now the Syrians had it. But it was Ahab's own doing that gave it into their hands. Ahab had made a treaty with the enemies of Israel, and they had not kept it. And now, having played the fool, Ahab wants to avenge his pride and ambition. He has many voices encouraging him to do what he wanted to do. 400 of the prophets on his payroll tell him, go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious and the Lord will be with you. And with two kings united together, how could the campaign fail? They would make a sudden attack and what was theirs would be theirs again. But something happened that almost upset the apple cart. They brought in a prophet of the Lord into that assembly that had gathered in the large square of the city, a man by the name of Micaiah. Micaiah painted a different picture of the military campaign. I saw all Israel scattered on the hill as sheep having no shepherd, they slapped Micaiah's face. They accused him of being a coward and a traitor, unpatriotic and undermining the morale of the people. They sentenced him to prison on a ration of bread and water. But as Micaiah was led away, he said to the prophets, you will see on that day who speaks for the Lord and who does not. And to Ahab he said, If you return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And to the vast assembly he said, Mark my words, O my people. It's difficult to say what impression that stormy session made upon the two kings. Jehoshaphat must have known he made a mistake right at the start by joining in with Ahab. And Ahab must have had some misgivings because that is borne out by what happens next in the narrative. Ahab is saying to Jehoshaphat, how would it be if I entered the battle in the disguise but you went in my chariot, dressed in your royal robes. And Jehoshaphat says, geez, that's a swell idea. Thanks a million. You'll wonder how he could have been suckered into a plan like that. Possibly it was argued that if both kings disguised themselves, it would practically be an admission of defeat and would demoralize the troops. Or possibly Jehoshaphat figured he had nothing to fear. The prophecy was against Ahab's life, not his. Or maybe the guy was so simple-minded, all he could think of was the glory of war. Leading the charge in the royal chariot. On the other side of the battlefield, the Syrians are making their plans. The commanders of the chariots are to zero in only on the chariot of the king of Israel. They assume that if they can kill or capture Ahab, the whole campaign will be over, and they're right. But what they didn't know was that Ahab entered into the battle in a disguise. And no sooner had the battle trumpet sounded 
And the Syrian chariots bore down on that one chariot that bore the king's insignia. And as they're pressing close, Jehoshaphat cries out, the text tells us. What's he crying? Hey, sirs, officers, I'm not a hip, you got the wrong guy. I'm not even supposed to be here. I want to get out of here and go home. Whatever the case, the Syrians knew that that crybaby was not King Ahab. And they turned away from him in disgust. And to show you how a higher hand is always ruling and overruling in the affairs of men, a Syrian soldier drew his bow and shot an arrow at random, not aiming at any target. And he never saw the chariot that sped into the path of the arrow or saw it stick in the crevice between the joints of a man's armor. Nobody knew that King Ahab was wounded. Wheel the chariot around, he told his driver. Get me out of the battle, for I'm sore wounded. But just then, they were in the thick of it, fighting hot on every side. And that command could not be carried out. All the day long, the fighting continued. While Ahab was propped up in his chariot, his life slowly ebbing away as the blood ran out of him onto the floor of the chariot. It must have been a ghastly scene. The king in disguise, mortally wounded, pale as death, propped up in a battle that he had no will to continue? Or was it a last heroic act on Ahab's part to prop himself up in the chariot, to inspire his men to keep on fighting in spite of his own hurt and wounds? As the sun went down, the slanting rays fell across the ashen face of the dead king. Nightfall brought rest to all of the weary warriors on both sides. And word carried through the camp, Ahab is dead. And then, leaderless and without direction, they scattered every man to his own city. And the prophecy of Micaiah passed into fulfillment. But there's more here if you got eyes to see it. Not of Micaiah's prophecy, but of something that Elijah said a long time ago in the vineyard of the man Naboth. Naboth is long dead. His vineyard has been attached to the palace as a park and a pool amid all of the shade trees and the walkways. Through the dark night speeded the chariot that bore the dead body of Ahab on its bloody bed back across the River Jordan, back to the capital city. There they buried Ahab. And there they washed the chariot of its bloody gore in the pool by the palace. It must have been a horrible sight in the pale moonlight as the wild dogs that prowl the city walls in the dark lapped up the water mingled with blood that flowed down out of the king's chariot. It seemed incredible when Elijah first said that. Nobody could have foreseen the chain of events that would lead to this. A literal fulfillment of the word of the Lord to Ahab. 
in the very place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab had not been able to stop it. Not by disguising himself, not by putting my K in prison, not by the voice of 400 prophets saying it ain't so, and not even by propping himself up in the chariot. Now that's something for you and I to remember about these promises and warnings of God. They may be ignored. They may be called irrelevant. They may be long in coming. But just you wait. As Micaiah said, on that day you will know who has spoken for the Lord and who has not. You see, today, we are told that the Ten Commandments are hopelessly out of date and, and the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. Smiling voices assure us that sexual liberty is a far greater improvement than the old fidelity in the bonds of marriage. Self-worth is attained by taking care of number one, they promise us instead of sacrificing and spending your lives for others. And all of the Christmas commercialism tells you that it's what you have, not who you are, that counts. Well, just you wait. Watch the end of this story. Aren't you people looking and seeing what's going on in the country in which you live. Why don't you judge for yourself? Do we really break the commandments of God? Or are we broken by the commandments of God? Psychiatrists are getting a hundred bucks an hour to tell troubled and confused souls you thought you were getting away with it, but you weren't. The postscript to the story tells us about Ahab's ivory palace and other of his architectural achievements. So what? Who cares? Of what benefit were they? to his people whom he left scattered on the far hills of Gilead. And what good were they to Ahab at the end? So stately, so beautiful, monumental. Like all the works of men, they have decayed and been destroyed and buried by the sands of time. What is a man profited if he gained the whole world? and lose his own soul? Jesus asked, calling for your answer. And this brings to a close our study of the book of Kings. You can follow the thread of the story in the second book of Kings, the continued adventures of Elijah and his successor Elijah. But it's all downhill, farther, faster, steeper away from God. A few more years, and the kingdom of Israel in the north will disappear from the stage of history without a trace and mysteriously be referred to ever after as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Things in Judea and Jerusalem and the south will last about a hundred years longer because the temple of God was still there because the people did return to the Lord occasionally, and every now and then they had a God-fearing king. But then the Babylonian hordes swept out of the east and carried them all away, uprooted and transplanted the entire nation on the far banks of the Euphrates River. And that good land 
that God had promised and God had given them lay desolate. The golden temple of Jerusalem in ashes. The walls of mighty Jerusalem level with the ground. A few of the names of these ancient kings linger in one's memory. Solomon, Jeroboam, Ahab, Jehoshaphat. But after a while, they all run together and blur in one's mind. Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joram, Jehu. You get sick and tired of reading about them. It's such a monotonous story. Their lives, their wars, their petty bickerings and self-seekings. And over and over again, this one line. He did not walk in the ways of the Lord. But he walked in the sins of his father. You know what happens? You begin to wish that once, just once, a real king would come along. A man of righteousness and mercy and justice. A king who would see himself as there for his people and not as his people there for him. A king who would care for his people and plan for his people and protect them from their enemies on the inside and the outside. A king to whom you would gladly pledge the allegiance of your heart and your hands. A king into whose keeping you would willingly surrender the whole of your life, holding nothing back. There is only one king like that. The one whose birth we are preparing to celebrate again. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.